this is, I, I tripped while hiking, so this is mostly the boot, I'm fine. Mostly the boot is just to keep me from doing further harm to myself. So I'll be moving around a little bit, but I am feeling fine. Um, I want to thank you. I want to thank you, Dean, for having me here and Sunshine. And Sunshine got neglected to mention that she and I met the, when I worked in, I, when I began my work in Congress, I went there through, for a program called the Canal Sea Grant Fellows Program, which takes scientists to go work in the U.S. administration in the United States Congress. And I think, I'd like to think that Sunshine and I are good examples of scientists who came, pursued our, our love and our desire to learn more about science and then incorporated other aspects to it. And I think in this, in this conversation, I'm going to talk, I'm from an NGO, Conservation International. And then science is, uh, Sunshine's doing what in this institution here are sort of typically, are not a typical academic institution, this, this cross-sectoral, bringing in journalists, talking about writing. And it's been very exciting during my career to begin to see the evolution of these interdisciplinary, multidisciplinary, cross-sectoral activities. And it's been, it's been very good, and it's been a, it's been a, we've seen the results of this in a lot of the work that's happening. What I'm going to talk about here, in part, is this Ocean Health Index. And it's an, in, so there's some words here, an integrated framework for implementing ecosystem-based marine and coastal management. So one of the things first, ecosystem, just to talk about what an ecosystem itself is, a simple definition for an ecosystem are all the living and non-living things interacting together in an area. So ecosystems could be the drop of water for a microbe. Or one of the programs I work with is on large marine ecosystems of which the oceans have been divided into, say, about 64 of them, all over the oceans in the world. So these large marine ecosystems are, in fact, quite large. What, what creates the boundary of an ecosystem is generally what the question is that you're asking or what we are working on. In these large marine ecosystems, there's generally some reason to have some kind of ecological, geological connection. Some ecosystems could be more relevant from a jurisdictional point of view. Your lungs could be an ecosystem for the bacteria that are, you know, not asthma, but give, give you, you know, giving you a cold. So an ecosystem is a, a defined but not very well bounded construct in which we study, you know, generally ecological, biological phenomena. So again, the, the living and non-living components that create in a system. And so to get to that, to get to the Ocean Health Index, and actually the ecosystem, used now more in a, in a sort of like a colloquial sense, the ecosystem in which this tool, this tool to capture data and action continuum, the ecosystem in which the Ocean Health Index functions is a matter of a few elements here that I'd like to talk about in this, in this presentation. Conservation International, the organization I work for, a non-governmental, a non-profit organization, as a boundary organization between science and policy, between sometimes business and policy, sometimes business and, and um, governments. And I'll give you a couple examples of that. Center for Oceans, the division within, you know, the, the Metcalf within University of Rhode Island, the Center for Oceans within the NGO as a, the subject matter expertise on oceans. Then this kind of philosophy, and this is very interesting working with the journalists here, and I have data there in the front, data, information, knowledge, and action, but I also want you to look at it in going the other way as well. Data to action could be science-based policy, but action to data could be policy-relevant science. Finding out what questions need to be asked, what questions are most urgent, and then going back and figuring out what science is needed to answer those questions, as well as taking from the science, the data, and going along this continuum to actions that are needed. You know, the data on climate science far preceded the policy actions that are on. The data were out there and action was needed. And then we might have some things in the, you know, a lot of this ecosystem-based work is very much an action to data continuum. We need to figure out how to balance Look at the Narragansett Bay, tourism, jobs, livelihoods, fishing, recreation, cultural and spiritual connection. How do you balance all of that? That's an action need. What are the data that are needed to get there? Then you get into the kind of technical piece of the Ocean Health Index, which is a tool 
to capture, to help structure this conversation. Because for many of us, we can have the narrative. We can talk about the need to balance all of these things, the need to balance fishing with recreation and with, with um, tourism and jobs and clean water. And, but when you get down to figuring out how do you keep all those things in balance, that's where we as a conservation organization that functions science-based, we approach our work science-based, have developed these tools to hold all this thinking together. And then finally, something I'm going up tonight to, or going down tonight to New York, where the first day of a five-day conference on one of the sustainable, one of the 17 sustainable development goals on the oceans is being discussed in a five-day conference. And I'll talk to you about the sustainable development goals which is a significant policy driver, which we help will help countries, we hope will help countries recognize or it is a mandate for action that we know will go towards marine conservation. So first, let me start on the organization, the organization Conservation International. We are focused on people and nature. We go on the premise that people need nature. Yes, many people can argue and say nature has an intrinsic right to exist, and we all believe that, and it is true. But by and large, the reason people are going to fight for nature is for the nature they need. And too, free, too infrequently, or too rare, too frequently, I should say, people don't realize the nature they need. You hear a lot about short-sightedness and policy making. People need nature, and that's the driver for our work at Conservation International. And then what we do, you don't have to read all these words, but from, rem oh, I'm sorry, I'm not gonna let you read any of them. <laughs> so there, <laughs> what we do, um, we work with partners at every level from remote villages to executive suites. My organization, and I like these little people need nature, and then I also like this, innovate, demonstrate, and amplify. And as an NGO, I feel that we need to follow all those lines, innovate, demonstrate, and amplify come up with new ideas, show that they work, and once you've gotten them working, get that information out there so that it can work in other places and or you can help figure out what factors make it work here and what are, that, what are the factors that are gonna be needed to put in place there. We can't restart the wheel every single coast, every single island, every single ocean. The innovate part as an NGO, and, I, and as Sunshine said, I came from an academic background and then moved into more of this policy and action and NGO world, sort of in the, my mid-career to date, and that, that what we, we, we need in our, in our innovate, in the NGO and our innovate part, we work a lot with academia. We actually all, we also work a lot with some of the tech companies to find out what are some of the cutting edge, what are some of the things you guys are doing, what are you finding out? Now how can we take those pieces, demonstrate that they work on the ground, and then once they do, amplify them. And I'm looking at the journalists now and the role that they play in amplifying some of these science and these solutions. So that's exciting. You can tell I'm excited to have landed in this. I feel very much having come through academia, working in Congress, working in the private sector, I'm very excited to be in the NGO world and where that allows me personally with all those, like, like Sunshine was saying, all those various things I've been lucky enough to do to kind of pull the pieces together. So I'm a real proud, um, working in the NGO world. And then so, just going quickly through these to give you a bit of the uh, background on our organization, we engage with governments. The Ocean Health Index in particular, I talk a lot about, this is a tool that generally, I end up working a lot in, in capitals, in countries' capitals. It is a governance tool. It is a tool to go in, and I'm not gonna have the hubris to say we change governments. Most governments gonna take a lot more than an NGO coming in saying this is a good idea. But a lot of them have this idea that healthy oceans, okay, we know oceans, we know healthy oceans are good, but we've already adding yet one more layer of bureaucracy, adding another oceans thing. We try to go in with this tool to create a governance mechanism, to something they can kind of layer on or weave across their work in, in, in their work in, um, in governing the country they work for, regulations managing for all of that. And so me in particular, my program, I end up working a lot with governments. I'm in there, in the capitals, helping them structure their, um, their governance structure for healthy oceans. Then with companies, one of the things when we bring the ocean, when we're asked to come into the country, not to come in and do it, but we're asked to come into the country, a country's recognized the need, they want this tool. When we're asked to come in and do this, we say that 
we, we, we absolutely need to be working with at least four major sectors. The government, civil society, academia or scientific institutions, and the private sector. When a major part of the tool, the Ocean Health Index, is stakeholder engagement. And so who are the stakeholders? And those four sectors, they don't capture all of them. The private sector could be very broadly at having fishing as well as having industry and all. But all of, to have a truly long-lasting plan, or plan that will last through time, you do need to have all of those sectors at the table. So as, a, as an NGO, we, we prioritize work with companies. We drive innovative science. I already mentioned that, working with academia, with tech companies to pull from them some of the things they're working on and how we can apply it, and also to hopefully drive them in some of the things they're working on and developing to meet some of the needs that we have identified in the world at large. And not to say that every tech company and every academic institution should or needs to be always thinking, how can I use this in Madagascar or Indonesia or South Africa? No, that's the role of this boundary organization who have enough scientists and people and technologists who understand that and then work with people in the field. Um, I was going to get to the slide. We, our, our organization is largely, more than three quarters of us work around the world, are, are stationed in places around the world. So can have our feet on the ground and head in the clouds. That's boots in the mud and head in the clouds is another one of our little sayings. But so that we can have, we can ground the work and then think, what's next? What's over the horizon? Ground it, does it work? Demonstrate, then what's next over the horizon? And we invest in nature. This is something very interesting, and, and for the journalists too, I'm sure you've begun to see the emergence of more and more discussion, not just emerging market instruments we've been talking about for a while, but then the emergence also of these innovative financing mechanisms, green, blue bonds, debt for nature swaps, and so that's another thing that we're working on is the financial mechanisms of money. I mean, money drives it all. It's one of the reasons, actually it is the reason that later in my career I went to get an MBA. Because I'd studied the science, I was working in Congress, and I, it was hopeful that science would have a role in decisions that were, make, were being made. And it was hopeful that the government could play a constructive role. But money was always going to be part of the equation. And understanding more, the drivers behind, the bottom line to really, you know, we talk about triple bottom line, but I almost feel that the triple bottom line talks about financial, social, and ecological or environmental. I, I could have understood the environmental and social, but the financial I wanted to. So we invest in nature as an NGO as well. And then locally, and this is something very, um, very important to me and also um, important to me just from a getting things done point of view and then also from a personal point of view. More than 25% of our budget goes into locally based organizations. Now I already told you about 75% of CI's people are there. We're not counting that. We're talking about going outside of CI and standing up the local NGOs. Local NGOs, they I feel are some of the biggest, the, 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 the most, the essential, the most crucial part of long-term environmental sustainability are the friends of Narragansett Bay, are the friends of Nosy Bay in Madagascar, are the local groups who really understand what's happening. Now, of course, those can't be the same people who understand what's happening globally. And I feel that's where these bingos, big international NGOs, a bingo, and a group like Conservation International, we're a bingo. We're a big international NGO, and I feel that our role is best served when we're coming in and helping local people do what they know best needs to be done, but might not know best how to do it. And then collaborating, working with organizations. That should go without saying, working with partners should go without saying, but just to say that. Where we work, we work around the world. These are some of the areas where CI in particular focuses. This is one that's very interesting to us, the Pacific Oceanscape. This whole, the Pacific Oceanscape might be a new term to you. It was a term that was brought up by the um, presidents of the South Pacific nations where they, say, they use that term oceanscape to indicate that their futures are tied together by the ocean, that they are not small island states, but they are large ocean states. They are large ocean countries. And if you look at a map of their EEZs, EEZ is the term for the Exclusive Economic Zone, which the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea has stated is the jurisdiction of a country. 
when you look at the EEZs of all these, you can't even see the countries here, but when you draw their EEZs, you would see these big structures that make up all of the Pacific Oceanscape there. So that's a political construct where the president said, our futures are tied together and they're tied together around the oceans. And then Conservation International has come in as a form of like sort of a secretariat to help them say, to help them figure out what do those futures look like? What are some of the threats? What are some of the challenges? And I'll get into that a little more when I get to the Center for Oceans section. And then how we are divided up. The more center, for, and this is within CI. These five groupings matrix together to do our work. Headquarter, these are the global, these are the programs that work across all of our global areas. More Center for Science, Environmental Leadership and Business, environment and peace, and conservation finance. And then we have regional programs like I showed in the map. Americas, Africa, Asia, Pacific, and oceans. Oceans treated as a region, which I think is interesting to treat that, to have that be a place where all of these four um, concentrated areas focus. And this is uh, our retiring CEO right now. He founded Conservation International 30 years ago. It's not a, it is not about nature. It is about people. Nature would figure out a way to survive, but would people? Human development and progress can't be successful unless conservation is a core issue, not a parallel track. And so again, that is a narrative that I think a lot of people could really grasp. Yet, a lot of times when we're going out to work, particularly in developing countries, and you would say, you know, people would kind of argue, yeah, you'll hear, we don't have time to worry about the environment. We have people who are starving. We have people who have no water. We're in a drought. We don't have time to worry about the environment. You still hear that. And it's not to come in and say, well, you need to, you know, the fish are more important than people. You know, that, you know you hear, well, what are the people going to eat? You know? You're in a drought. Do you think that that's just entirely accidental? Or do you think maybe there's been a little bit of overplant? These environment, and this is, this is the work we do, to put people at the center and then to make sure that the environment that, that supports them, the nature that they need to survive, is, is intact, is, continues to be intact. And then one, one more thing, too, is indigenous people. And so Conservation International is about to have an offshoot. It's actually being funded. This is a little bit about our funding. Come, we have you know, major gifts, major donors. One of our major donors is Laureen Powell Jobs. She's the widow of Steve Jobs from Apple. She's on our board, and she's been working with us a lot. And one of the main items or one of the main issues that she's taken on is indigenous people's role and right in having a healthy nature, their role and right to have that. And it's not to come in, and we, and we have, there's been a lot of back and forth, and you can never totally say it correctly, but to avoid some sort of paternalistic, do we know what to do? Like I said, to have the people local supported by what we bring in, hopefully sophisticated, world-class knowledge to support these people, and then also to support the rest of the planet. Since about 30% of the remaining intact nature is under the jurisdiction, sits you know, sometimes very loose jurisdiction and not respected jurisdiction of indigenous peoples. Now, as we all know that they're often the most marginalized, most threatened of human lifestyles, most taken advantage of, most in need of a healthy nature, most in need of healthy nature. And so that's a commitment that Conservation International, when we talk about people, now we're really targeting in, in one of our aspects, into the equity of people allow, being allowed to live the lives they've lived as well as helping them serve a global purpose and keeping 30% of the world's remaining intact nature that way. Uh, protected areas are one part of our work. Uh, people have differing ideas on protect and conserve, pr preserve and conserve, conserve, put it away, have it for multiple use. But protected areas, and I'm going to mention that a little bit in um, the ocean part, protection is still an important part. Having reservoirs, having areas where you just set aside, just because you should, national parks, protected areas, coastal, these are important, and this is just one metric of the amount of area of land and sea that CI has been involved in. But I mostly put this up just to throw that tidbit of thought out there of the role protected areas do and sometimes don't play in overall conservation. And our vision, and I'll go from this to the next section, imagine a healthy, prosperous world in which societies 
are forever committed to caring for and valuing nature for the long-term benefit of people and all life on Earth, that all societies were interlinked on this planet Earth, on this planet ocean, and that that's the role we all have to, we have to play. The Center for Oceans, the challenges in the oceans, habitat destruction and species loss, overfishing, pollution, and climate change. Maybe not a completely comprehensive list, but it really takes into, ac takes, it takes into account some of the major forces changing the oceans that we rely on. Our approach, this is one approach, the Center for Oceans approach within Conservation International, we got a term SALT because you need a nice acronym, where we have sound strategies. And I went, I went back and forth on sound or scientific, but also wanting to make sure that the word scientific is social science, is political science, sound strategies based across all of these sectors with strong alliances, partnerships, but partnerships doesn't work in the word SALT, so we use alliances. Effective learning, and that's a really important part, I believe, an important role that NGOs can play is knowledge management and knowledge sharing around the world. So you don't have to learn the same lesson. The same lesson doesn't have to be learned in every part of the world. And that's something that's been key in our Ocean Health Index, is to capture what's being learned in one country or the other so that it's at, for use for other countries. And then proven tools, which we're going to get to. We are divided into four general areas, and I'm going to talk a little bit more in depth about blue nature and blue horizons. Blue climate is sort of as it sounds, but the thing here is to recognize both adaptation and mitigation. Blue carbon, for example, is one area our organization is focusing on. Blue carbon is all forms of carbon that are sequestered in the ocean, but coastal areas, mangroves, estuarine wetlands, store a tremendous amount of carbon, which is both important if left to perform and as they should, they will continue to store carbon. If destroyed, if they are dried out, that carbon will be released. But also healthy coastal ecosystems, and our reporter from Louisiana can say that for sure, are also very important in adapting to the changes from climate change we're already seeing. What is it, how much wetland will take a, a hurricane down 10%? There's always this statistic of a... Football field an hour, thing. Well, that's how much is disappearing, a football field an hour. But it's something like a 100 feet coastline of healthy wetland or some metric that's not that huge will reduce the intensity of a hurricane as it comes from the ocean onto land. So not only are these wetlands important in storing carbon, or at the very least, keeping them intact so they don't yet release more carbon, they can also help us adapt to the changes from climate. And then blue production, two pieces here, transform wild caught fisheries and fish farming for livelihoods and food security. Um, Maurice and I, who's, he's doing investigative work on fishing, he and I were talking about aquaculture. And in many cases, we think of aquaculture and the damages it's done the damages it's done shrimp farming, tearing up coastlines in, in Southeast Asia, um, or introducing diseases. These, these, they come in, the shrimp farms are viable for like five or six years, then they leave the whole area diseased. They've destroyed the natural stock. Horrible, however, more, I think one out of seven people now on the planet derive the primary source of protein from seafood. And I think upwards of about half of the seafood being eaten around the world, this number astounds me, but a lot of the seafood being eaten around the world is already aquaculture. And we have a growing population. And done right, the ocean can be a completely renewable source of food. You don't need fertilizers, you don't need tilling, it's, it just regenerates and done right, we can get a lot of protein out of the ocean. Done wrong, we can cut ourselves right off. Let it cut out the natural population and also cut out like the shrimp farms in, um, example. And so this is something that we know we have to figure out. We can't just say aquaculture is bad. A lot of it is right now. It needs to get better and there needs to be more aquaculture. So having to, acknowledging that and along that action to data continuum, the action, we need good sustainable aquaculture. Move back along that. What sort of science do we need to get there? And that's where a boundary organization like an NGO can sit. Now, in more, more detail on blue nature, because this is the part where I sat in. We just couldn't come up with a better name to capture kind of all of these 
broad, intense human. I hope I'm not blocking this too much for the folks that are over here. Um, this, in, this intense connected oceans is what we call for our data, for our knowledge management, for being able to, we do some, a lot of things called south-south exchanges, taking folks from Brazil and bringing them over to Mozambique, for example, and, or vice versa so that one can learn from the other of how they're doing it in that one country and facilitating that learning in a non-political, just bring them over to say, what are you doing? Or bringing, bringing fishermen from the north of Madagascar to the south of Madagascar, which is really quite, a lot of them haven't ever traveled you know, 10 miles beyond their village. Bringing them down to show this is how we've been successful in putting aside some protection. This is actually something CI has done, protecting some of the coastal area here, this is how they manage it, hearing from the fishermen themselves, and then having these fishermen go back up to northern Madagascar to try it out themselves. So this connected oceans, that's where a lot of that work sits. Governance and policy, the group I run. Governance, like I said, helping governments govern better for a healthy ocean. Not change the government, but help them incorporate into their governing structures, into their governments, new structures to help govern for a healthy ocean, and policy the Sustainable Development Goals, the UN policy. There are some of these global policy mechanisms, the um, Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, or the, um, the uh, what is it, the UNICCC, the, the Convention on Climate Change, these large policy mechanisms that, you know, the UN can be a lot of talk, talk, but it really does help set the stage. You, we, we saw it, you know, for better or worse, and it's actually, the jury might be out whether it was for better or worse, the president's decision to pull out of the UN policy agreement on climate change. You know, we could argue about that, but we've sort of started to see in the first couple of days some pretty interesting and very positive responses to that. May have been, you know, may have been actually an acceleration of some of the work that was aimed to get done under that treaty. But again, the purpose of these treaties, how they might work, how they might come out, but that's where a lot of my policy work sits. And then blue economies. I mentioned a little bit about the, conserv the f conservation financing, just the same sort of thing happening in oceans. And then Blue Horizons, and this for the scientists in the room, and some, this is some of the innovation. This is the, this is the step before some of the innovations uh, that we want to do. Plastics, how to deal with plastics in the ocean. God, I mean, the single-use plastics. Some of the, I have one woman on my, t uh, that works, a colleague of mine, one of the big things, her husband works for, I think it's the American Chemistry Council or, or something. They both came out of this very highly scientific technical background. One of the biggest things she's doing is she, one of the biggest ways she's hoping to solve the plastics problem, a lot of it isn't about the production. A lot of it isn't about just the use of plastics, that they end up in the wrong place and why they end up in the wrong place is because recycling can be hard, disposing of it. Like this bottle alone, I don't even know, but I can say for sure that there are three different plastics in this bottle alone. The plastic of the bottle, the plastic of the lid, and the plastic of the label. And so my colleague Jen Howard, and with her connection to the American Chemistry Council, they're looking and seeing if they can get single stream plastics. That if there is a plastic that can be all the same from the cap label in the bottle, so that when this thing goes into it, it just gets, gets, it can get sorted like that, as opposed to getting sorted like that and then get the ring off and then get the label off. It can get sorted like that. It can move it into the recycling stream that much more quickly. That is a significant issue in the oceans, and solving it is not the job of a marine biologist. Solving it is the job of a chemist and an engineer and a manufacturer. But linking, like I said, being that boundary organization between the problems we're seeing and the results of those problems, and then going, okay, what are the solutions we need and who can help us do that? Who can we partner with to keep these bottles out of the ocean by making them just one step more simple to recycle? So that's, I'm just so excited about that as a horizon. Resilient Islands is something, we're actually working with Google X. They now just call themselves X, which I think was a bad idea, because you work with X, and it sounds like you're just saying, I forget the name, I'm with X. But Google, actually, they're, they're X, the moonshot factory. That's what they call themselves now. But Google X is actually with us at the conference down in UN. And we're doing a, um, I would keep doing that. We're doing a session on resilient islands, which is very much this design to come up with new ideas 
co-designing for island resiliency. And island resiliency is going to be everything from finance and bringing in investment to dealing with waste streams to jobs to keeping the young people who are full of ideas, keeping them at home on the islands and not having a brain drain. That's a big part of the conservation of these islands, keeping the people who care about the islands in place, having them, giving them a reason to stay, a way to raise their families. That's a resilient island. That's a, marine, that's a marine conservation solution, keeping young people in place on islands. Now, marine biologists, we're not going to do it, but identifying the problem and bringing in the partners. Seamounts, global learning. Now, this is sort of the segue section here. And this is what I was talking about earlier, the science-based policy. This continuum from data, information, knowledge, and action. This is kind of the thing we're, kind of, we're most familiar with, which the journalists here may have worked with a lot. You look at the science paper, and then you figure out you know, where is that can be applied. This is really interesting, and I think a lot of our scientists' colleagues have begun to think and talk, and you go to the conferences, and you're always going to see a section on storytelling now. Storytelling represents, so coming down here, so first on the storytelling in the middle, but data to information. We have our numbers. What did we talk about today in the paper, looking at the figures? That figure is a representation of the data. That's changing the data into information. How do we represent? How do we visually represent it? The information being put into a, rel being made relevant by being placed in its context, using the experience. And I stressed how we have people working us around the world. 95% of our people, of Conservation International's people who work in foreign offices are from the country, from that country. That's not a huge, that's the, a lot of times you have the expat factor. Try to keep the expats low. Bring in the national people, bring in the people who know about the area, who can take that information and put it in the context. They have the experience and then storytelling. And then taking that information into knowledge. What can we do with this? How do we do it? Tangible, strategy, influence, transformation, but influence here. Who are the influencers? Who is the president listening to? Is the president listening to that oil company? Can we work with that oil company, make them an influencer? Um, I remember I, when I was working in the Gulf Coast, I think it was Alabama, the mayors had incredible sway there, even bigger sway than some of the congressmen, like Mississippi was sort of a congressman state, but Alabama was kind of a mayor state. So those were their influencers when we were trying to get things passed. Understanding that, who's listening and who's going to reinforce your message to transform behavior to lead to action. Then taken in the other direction, policy relevant science. And that's what I, you'll find, I've talked about that in a way a lot. Here is the problem, what do we need to solve it? With the scientists, and this was when I gave this talk, I gave a talk similar to this a couple weeks ago at a university and it was mostly a scientific audience. And this was the slide I lingered on for the scientists to say when you have an action, when you are gonna try to work on, a, on something, you wanna work on a problem, and this was talked about in our group today too, the number of authors on a paper. One person alone probably isn't gonna come up with the best solution. And this is something, you know, this interdisciplinary, as I said, it's becoming more and more common. Relationships, motivations, working in collective, working with stakeholder engagement, along this action, knowledge, information to the data, to the science we need, is a lot of co, co-defined, co-production, cooperative. A lot of working with others and bringing in, you know, like this. How do we get plastics out of the ocean? Well, we're going to talk to industry. We're going to talk, you know, we could talk to consumers about not using them. Not, well, people keep using it. Just, you've got, so what are some of the other solutions along the way there? And this actually, in my day to day, even though, you know, I do a lot of managing and going to these meetings, this is what I love to think about. These two pieces here, this how do we move, how do we change behaviors? How do we get the information with the right information efficiently, using our resources um, efficiently? And then into the tool of the section. And so we've got probably about 15 more minutes here. So we're going to talk about the tool for maybe eight or 10 minutes and then finalize, uh, find a finish up. Six minutes. OK, we're going to go a little more quickly than that. <laughs> so actually, this is, even though this is a tool, I, I have a feeling that I, I'm, I'm more excited about having talked a little bit more in depth about those things for the audience here. But the Ocean Health Index. For our journalists, how do you define a healthy ocean? A healthy ocean sustainably delivers a range of benefits to people, 
now and in the future. Our approach, my group, and I work in collaboration, my program, the Ocean Health Index, is a direct collaboration with Conservation International and the University of California at Santa Barbara. So we have our scientists and our techie geeks, and they're doing GitHub and our programming and all of that, and creating a toolbox to capture the knowledge. And we at CI are doing, working on the policy mandates so that the Ocean Health Index will be used. We're working on figuring out what do the people on the ground know? Like, what is the capacity? If you bring this state-of-the-art tool to the ground, what is their capacity for uptake? What do we need to train? What's the stakeholders who need to be involved? And so that's the work we're doing. Tailorable and repeatable framework and process to measure the health of coupled ho human ocean ecosystems in different contexts by adapting to local environmental needs and characteristics, cultural priorities, capacities, and information available in availability and quality. We have broken the ocean into 10 benefits, which we believe are comprehensive. Um, people could argue about how these might be grouped up. Transportation is one that a lot of people don't see that we considered in livelihoods and economies. We brought, we're doing an um, ocean health index in Hawaii and they looked at tourism and recreation and they said, no, those are two very different things. Those are not the same. Okay, then you can break that up. But right there, that conversation starter, that's one of the key things. So taking the scientific tool, putting a picture menu of the benefits from a healthy ocean, setting the table with those 10 benefits and say, all right, if you're gonna manage an ocean, you're gonna need to think about these 10 things. Daniel and I, we were talking about Somalia. I'd love to go work there, it's such great need. We're not gonna go in and talk to Somalia about tourism and recreation as the next most important thing they need to do. But we're gonna say, these are the things, let's look, at, let's look 20 years in the future. Rwanda, 25 years ago, was not a hot spot for tourism. Now people are paying $750 to go sit 45 minutes in front of gorillas. Because fortunately, in all the trouble that that country faced, they didn't take down that last remaining stand of forest. So in Somalia, if we were to go in, and hopefully one day we will, we might spend about two minutes talking about tourism and recreation. Hey, do you have an area that a lot of sharks come to? Any good coral reefs? Any whale sharks coming in here? Any whales? Any big mammals? Oh, you do? People see mammals, mammals from this point? Well, let's try and not put a desalination plant on that point. Okay, let's, maybe we can put a 10 kilometers down or 10 kilometers up coast, all right? Because who knows, that might be a hot spot for tourism someday. Done. Now let's get on to the more important things, food provision, clean water. You go into the Seychelles with this. Seychelles pretty much has their act together. You're probably going to start with tourism and recreation there or Hawaii. And so the fitting it to those different places. Um, for those of us, we were working on uh, papers today. This was put out in Nature in 2012 with about 33 different authors from so uh, social sciences, economics, practitioners, communication, Compass, Communication Partnership for Science in the Sea. They are a whole part of this. And this was when the, when the tool hit the ground. Two minutes to wrap up? Three, okay. So this is when the scientific tool came out. Now, this, I'm going to jump ahead here. The slides might not follow exactly what I'm saying, so I want to just get this last part. Um, as an index, one of the things an index does is measure the same thing in all places. So every year we do a global index in which we have more than 120 data layers that go into all the pieces of those 10 benefits. We look at the status of those benefits. How many people are able to fish? Those people who rely on fish for their subsistence. Are people able to fish? If they are able, what are the resilience measures that are allowing them to fish? If they aren't able, what are the pressures working against them being able to fish? There aren't fish there. There's too many trawlers taking their fish away. Or the coastline is being covered up by hotels and they can't get their boats into the water. These are pressures working against them being able to fish. These are the sort of data layers that go in. And then every year we do Global Ocean Health Index. And that's interesting. We've been in the, we're in the fifth year of that. We score, the global ocean has a score of 71, and then various things you can imagine, you know, globally lasting special places, how many people, how much protected area hasn't come around, um, too much. Fisheries, not surprisingly, is quite low. Mariculture, aquaculture in the ocean, really very low there. These are the way, and so it just gives a snapshot. But for me, the work I do in the developing world, Another thing this does, the most important thing this does here, is it takes, it takes our global data 
And then we can take the global data and then when we go into one country, and Brazil's not the greatest example necessarily because they have, they have, well, they are actually right now a little bit in a mess, but we, um, they have a lot of data. They're, Brazil is one of the countries, they're, they're doing okay, but we are still working with them. But we take Brazil and we come down to here and then we can use the global data. Let me back up, I'm not explaining it the right way. With the global database, we get the best available data on the global scale, and we split it up into 220 EEZs all over the world. Do I have that? Um, I don't have the global map of where we work, but I'll leave this one up here. And so we break it into, these two, into 220 EEZs, exclusive economic zones, all over the world, and we measure that globally. But what that then allows us to do is to take that global data and go down to a country level, go into Fiji, one of the first countries we worked with. We took the global data set and went down into that country and said, do you have any better local data sets that we can replace the global data? Because it would be much better to work with a local data set. And about 20% of the global data layers could be replaced with local data for what Fiji already had lying around. But another 80% couldn't. And so what it allowed us to do is get this model, bring it down to the local scale and give them a place to start. So you don't have to go in and have this paralysis by analysis. We need more data, we need more data before we can begin. Now truly it would be more desirable to have local data for every single one of those data layers, but if you don't have it, it allows them to begin the conversation and then to say what's the next most important piece of data we need to collect and then iterate through that. And that's the tool, that's the, that's, I'm gonna, I'm gonna end on this one, um, that's the tool, that's the purpose of this tool is to be able to go in, start the conversations, stand back and let them happen and then let the, give the countries a way to capture what they are learning and go from there so that they don't have to start over, so they don't have to start over, we can incorporate knowledge learned in other areas and in too many of our countries, including the United States, the administration changes, it feels like you're back to square one. So in having a tool like this, one hopes that it at least creates some history of the work that's been done and gives a starting place time after time. Maybe there's a crisis and you're diverted from the ocean for a while. You can come back to this. You can then incorporate the new global data and continue on. And so that's one of the key things, to make a scientifically rigorous, state-of-the-art tool that actually lives and breathes in the areas where it works. So I'm going to stop here. Sorry, I, I went on a little bit too long on some of the other areas. Um, didn't get a chance to mention the Sustainable Development Goals at the United Nations. It's, again, it's put in place for the next 15 years to give countries a roadmap for how to sustainably develop everything from education, livelihoods, oceans, forests, agriculture, uh, climate change, um, and if you want more information on that, I'll be happy to talk to you at the reception. So thank you very much.